we won all kinds of awards. We won a CNO safety award three times. We won various gunnery and bombing and stuff. And we were a real tight knit group. Our first combat situation was with demons. And the demons were, were not a very good aircraft. They um, had a very fancy radar in it. And that's the only reason they bought the airplane. But it, its engines were terrible. It had one huge J-71 engine in it, and it was terrible. And you had a constant fire warning light from the fire warning system because the engine actually grew three inches and shrunk from the time it was heated and cooled. So when he went in the burner, it would uh, expand and the heat would set off a fire warning. Uh, he didn't know if he had a fire back there in his engine or not. So if it had a previous fire warning gripe and you checked the system out and it was good, you didn't want to give that one to a pilot because he knew when he hit in the burner, he's going to get that light again. To change that fire warning system, you had to roll the engine out, change all of the sensors, roll the engine in, set it up to get it uh, tested, tested an air test on it, and you lost the airplane for days. So we made the first cruise. We got initiated to bombing. We got initiated uh, to QB Point in the Philippines. And later on, QB Point was taken back by the Filipinos. And the Air Force and the Navy was run out of there. And the Russians went in and got the port that we built. But that's all another story. Well, I'll give you a scenario about it here. Start out with, you've got a good 80 aircraft sitting around the flight deck and you got about 60 air airplanes on the hangar deck. It varies depending on the, which carrier you're on. Fortunately, I was at one point in my career, I was on the first nuclear carrier, the Enterprise. The Midway is now a museum in San Diego, and it's really worthwhile to go there and visit. But they modernized it quite a bit from the end of the war, the big war, by putting an extra catapult hanging off the angle of the aircraft carrier. <clears throat> and they put an elevator behind it, and they stuck an elevator out on the side to kind of balance the weight. So now you don't have an elevator in the center line. You have an elevator up on the starboard, an elevator back aft on the port, and another elevator back aft on the starboard. And that gave them three catapults. So you could really shoot three different airplanes off within about 30 seconds apart. The end of World War II was kind of the end of the prop aircraft. All through the 50s, we changed aircraft type so fast that in a 10-year period, I worked on about 15 new type of airplanes. They started out with the first jet, and that was the T-2B 
which was a modified Air Force uh, F-86, basically. It was a two-man tandem airplane, single engine, and they used it against the um, MiGs in Korea. And they used the F-86, which was the next Air Force primary fighter that came along because the jet could go faster, could go much higher. It couldn't go as anywhere near as far as the prop airplanes could, but at least it could tangle with the MiGs. The C-47 Thunderbolt and the other prop aircraft were limited to about 300 to 400 miles an hour. The first jet could pass that 500 miles an hour, but it couldn't get into supersonic except in a dive. And that didn't come along till the mid 50s. But <coughs> it was during the mid 50s and I'd like to break the periods up into time frames. My life frame started out in the 50s through the 60s, and that was with the props and the introduction of jets into the Navy. And then you get into the 60s and 70s, which was basically all jets and more advanced, heavier, longer range, fighter, faster airplanes. And then you get into the 70s to the 80s, and then we get into the modern day aircraft, because they were developed in the 70s and the 80s. And then of course, from that point on, you get into what I call the space age, where everything had to go at least Mach 2 or Mach 3, actually, we've got a couple of them that went into Mach 4. <clears throat> the heavier you make the aircraft and the bigger you make it to do the job, the, the cost of the plane goes out of sight. When we get to the age of the F-111, which was designed in 1965 and actually put into service in 1967. You talked of an airplane that would cost you billions of dollars to do the R&T and to get into service, and then about $60 billion per aircraft. So the cost went out of sight when you start talking, but the function of the aircraft was designed, like McNamara said, all three services would use the same airplane, and as we all know later, it didn't work out. The Navy wanted a sport, little fast sports car, the Air Force wanted a dump truck, and we settled for a station wagon. So when you get into the billions of dollars of cost of the space age aircraft, they get priced out of sight. They have to do the job, and that was the work in the 60s and 70s to make that coming aircraft do what all of the earlier aircraft did. Along with that, you had to change the carrier type. You had to be able to shoot them off faster and you had fewer carriers. Today, I believe we only have actually functioning about nine carriers. One is always in rehab and the others are spaced between the Atlantic and the Pacific Fleet. And we depend on a lot of our shore stations to pick up the in-between 
and our satellites to do the reconnaissance and stuff. So we don't need the type of aircraft that were designed in the 40s, 50s, until we get into the 60s, in the jet age. When you had the Charlie 27s, half of the aircraft on the flight deck were all props. And we had a few other reconnaissance airplanes and stuff. So when you ran around the flight deck, you were blown over unless you could crawl from pad eye to pad eye and keep away from the props. But you had hundreds of people up on that flight deck. Every airplane had a plane captain that was in it, warming it up before the pilots got there. Then the pilots had to navigate while that airplane was just idling to get into the cockpit and get the plane captain out. Then we had to have the blue shirts, which were the guys that would unfold the wings and move the airplane in a position to where the pilot could thro throttle up and create a lot of blast behind them. And then you had to have the yellow shirts so that the yellow shirts were the cops, the plane directors. They'd point where everything and the pilot had to listen to that yellow shirt. If he didn't listen to the yellow shirt, he would cause a, an accident, surely. And then, of course, you had to have the guys in the blue shirts with the gas signal on them. And they were the gas kings. They fueled the aircraft. And in the 50s, we got into the habit of refueling and rearming the aircraft while they were turning, which was a no-no prior to that because of the, the gas that was used on the prop planes was highly flammable, easy to torch off. It was gasoline high-tech gasoline. Later, we got into the jet age. We switched it to a JB, JP formula, which was kerosene, basically a kerosene base that was looped up a little bit. In the jet age, we got into liquid fuels, which we'll talk about later, and we got into afterburners. But now you've got all these guys running around the flight deck just to get the airplane shot in the air or to recover them. You've got the guys that are in yellow shirts with a um, icon on their jersey which tells them that they operate the catapults. The other guy with the yellow shirt and a different icon he operates the catapults. You have others with an icon that operate the elevators. And those guys are directing the pilots and running the machinery. You have other guys like me in green shirts. We're the maintenance guys. We're up there meeting the pilots when they get out of the airplane making decisions and coming back up to repair the aircraft. And we have guys that are in a white jersey with a stripe. And they are the last guy that will troubleshoot an airplane and give it a final go. They run around to make sure nothing came loose after it got started, nothing got blasted and got intake and they are usually four guys in white shirts for each squadron that are making the final inspection before they turn them over to the cats and the directors.